It is Wednesday, June 15th, 2022. We are here tonight to study from the book of Genesis. We are in Genesis chapter 8 at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are glad that you've joined us this evening. We would certainly invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 930 for a Bible study. We're getting back to our study of Paul's letters to the church in Thessalonica. And then we also hope to meet together for worship at 1030. And we'd love to see you. We're having a song service this Sunday. It's been several years since we've done that due to COVID, but we're finally back to being able to do that. We were aiming for the last Sunday in May, but it just didn't work out. This looked like a better Sunday to do it. So this coming Lord's Day 1030, we'll have a special emphasis on singing and get to sing a few extra songs together. If you have any questions about what you see or hear in our class tonight or at any time, uh, on our Sunday assembly or class, give me a call at 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. I mentioned last week we're still having trouble receiving text over the church line going back for several months now. So if you've tried to text us, uh, we're sorry about that, but those texts have not gone through. So we're working on this. It's a work in progress. We're still having some issues, but give us a call. And if I don't get your call, um, I'll be glad to return it, leave a message on the church line, and uh, we'd love to get back to you. Uh, be safe out there tonight. Hope everybody is okay. I know I'm recording this about uh, 920 on Wednesday morning. Looks like we're expecting some maybe more severe weather coming in this afternoon and evening in Wisconsin. And uh, some stuff came through a couple days ago, didn't it? And I think we lost a big branch at, at church. Uh, the Bussy sent a picture of that. So I don't know if the city ended up taking that whole tree down or just trimming it up. We'll find out soon. Uh, but anyway, uh, something coming in this afternoon, so I hope you are all able to uh, to stay safe. Uh, because of the Bible class, I've turned off our air conditioning system, so it's a hot day. And uh, just barely keeping up as it is, but we have a vent blowing right on the microphone here that kind of made it sound like thunder. If you remember that a year or so ago, we figured out it was the uh, air coming through our HVAC system. So that's off. I'm slowly losing oxygen in the uh, in the office down here. So looking forward to getting through this and uh, getting the air conditioning back on on the southwest side of Madison. Um, last week, you may remember I said that uh, while my sister was in town, we went to 14 of the 20 major thrift stores in the Madison scenario and that we hope to do the remaining six on Thursday. That was last Thursday. So I just want to let you know, mission accomplished in that regard. We did all 20 of the Madison thrift stores over a two-day period last week. Uh, some of you know that we get each other Christmas presents from thrift stores, that we leave the tags on to prove to each other how cheap we are. And she did find me a very nice wool base layer shirt for hiking on our excursion last week. It's a shirt she has now told me to forget about between now and Christmas this year. So I will try diligently after the reference tonight to forget about that shirt until I see it again in a few months. But uh, last week we started in Verona. We went across to Stoughton, then up to Sun Prairie, then to Wanakee, then Middleton, and then back to Madison for the rest. But it was a good experience. And I just wanted to share that as my good news this week. Anyway, she's back now uh, safely home in Washington and just uh, wanted to let you know what we've been up to. Uh, tonight, we are back to the book of Genesis. Genesis, of course, is a book of beginnings written primarily by Moses. And tonight, we're continuing in our study of the flood in Genesis chapter 8. So we have references to the flood coming in chapter 6. And then we have the flood itself in chapters 7 and 8. And then we'll wrap it up next week in chapter 9. But last week in chapter 7, we learned that Noah and his family get on the ark with the animals. It rains for 40 days. The fountains of the deep also burst open as well, and the floodgates of the sky also. So water is coming from absolutely everywhere. Uh, last week, we introduced a chart from the Beacon Bible Commentary printed several decades ago, but this is a chart that for many years has helped me understand the chronology of the flood and I'll mention this again tonight, but it's just easy for us to assume that the flood was 40 days, 40 nights, and then it's over, without really realizing that it was actually quite a bit more than that, and we started to open the door to that last Wednesday evening. Well, on the chart, we have God's announcement that the flood would take place in seven days, then we have it raining for a period of 40 days, then we have the flood lasting for another 110 days. So we're now 150 days into the flood at the end of chapter 7, for a total of around five months. And so we'll get back to the rest of the timeline in just a moment, but just wanted to give that kind of brief review from last week. Uh, but tonight we start with Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. So we'll have it on the screen here if you're able to join us in that way. 
Uh, if not, or even if you're able to, it'd be good to have a Bible open in your own lap on a device or the hard copy. But Genesis chapter 8 verses 1 through 5 is where we start for tonight. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained, and the water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. In the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. The water decreased steadily until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible." Well, obviously, the best part of this passage is that God remembered Noah. And it's not as if God had forgotten about Noah and, oh, wow, there's a guy in a boat down there and kind of that kind of thing. That's not it at all. So I, I think the point is God didn't just seal Noah in the ark and leave him there. But God is concerned about what is happening. Obviously, he loves Noah. Noah is a righteous person and finds grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God then causes a a wind to pass over the earth, the water starts to subside, the, the fountains of the deep, the floodgates of the sky are closed. And so that no longer happens. And then we have this note that the rain, uh, that the rain stops or the rain is restrained. So it's not uh, stopped completely, uh, but we still have rain today, just not to the extent with the floodgates and the fountains and, and so on as we've had during the flood. So the flood waters start to decrease. Uh, the next mark on that timeline comes in the 17th day of the seventh month. That's the ark rest on the mountains of Ararat. Uh, but even now, we're only about halfway through the year of the flood because the waters continue to decrease until the 10th month when the tops of the mountains become visible. I wanted to just briefly return to the chart here. And I've grayed out, or maybe more accurately, blued out the rest of the chart. But just to emphasize that we still have quite a ways to go in our timeline. We're only about halfway through at this point. So as I understand it, at least as of Genesis 8-5, we are just under eight months in at this point. Before we move on from this first paragraph in chapter 8, maybe we could try to imagine the relief that would come from having the ark rest on the mountains of Ararat. I don't know if we can put ourselves in Noah's place here, but just imagine bobbing around in the waves for several months. I mean, just a total scene of utter chaos. And maybe we can imagine the uh, seasickness, the uncertainty of everything. And then we're finally resting on dry ground again. Imagine floating for several months and then uh, feeling and hearing the bottom of that giant barge bounce and hit on the rocks beneath and then finally come to a rest and then finally being there on the ground again. It just must have been a huge relief and I'm trying to put myself in their position. Uh, all of this has been so strange and so terrifying. It just must have been an awesome thing to finally feel uh, that the boat was on dry ground once again. By the way, as I was working on this slide around 5.30 this morning, I overheard on the news um, the floodwaters are starting to recede in Yellowstone National Park. And so here I am typing about the floodwaters receding and my kind of ears perk up with that little comment on the news. But anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. But after any kind of a flood, certainly there is a great relief when those floodwaters start to recede. And even today, receding floodwaters can be newsworthy as they were this morning. So let's continue on then with Genesis chapter 8, verses 6 through 12, the next paragraph. Genesis 8, verses 6 through 12. Then it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent out a raven, and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, so she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. So he waited yet another seven days. And again he sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. As I see it, Noah is basically testing uh, to see whether it is safe to get out. He does this by sending um, several birds, I think on four separate missions, if I understand this correctly, in intervals of seven days. So a raven and then a dove. 
Uh, the raven just flies around, and I don't know, we're not told too much here other than that. Some of the commentaries were speculating that the raven could land on floating debris, uh, maybe the bodies of animals that had died in the previous year in the flood, and maybe it was eating off of those as ravens are known to do, but we don't really know. It's not conclusive here as to what the raven determines. Um, on the first time out for the dove, the dove can't find a place to land, so she returns, and that's uh, that makes sense to us. The second time out, the dove comes back with a freshly picked olive leaf, uh, indicating that the water had abated, so there were trees showing somewhere in the uh, vicinity of where the ark has, had landed. I read an article earlier today about... Um, about olive branches being able to bud underground and to leaf under under not underground but under, underwater I should have said which was kind of interesting so just today we know that this is able to happen and uh, just as kind of a confirmation of what Noah sees here but the the water had abated to the point where the dove could go and pick a branch and bring it back to Noah and then the third time the dove simply leaves and doesn't come back and I'm I'm hoping that's a good sign hopefully you know, not some pterodactyl come snatched it out of the sky or something. But uh, anyway, we have the dove disappearing, and Noah takes that as a sign that it's pretty much over. So let's continue then with Genesis chapter 8, verses 13 through 19. Genesis chapter 8, verses 13 through 19. Now it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the twenty-seventh day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth, and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, uh, went out by their families from the ark. Uh, up in verse 13, Noah removes the covering of the ark. He looks out. It's dry outside. And so God then tells Noah to leave, to let the animals out so they can breed abundantly and repopulate the earth. And Noah obeys. And he leaves the ark with his wife and his sons and his sons' wives with him. Concerning the pterodactyl, I guess that would have been on the on the boat with Noah. So maybe that's not what happened to the dove. Anyway, don't know what happened there. But anyway, the dove doesn't come back. He takes that as a sign. And uh, God communicates here. Uh, just a brief update on the timeline then. We have the birds being sent out. The water's finally draining completely. Everybody leaving the ark. So the total time from the beginning of the flood... Until everybody gets off the ark, as I understand it here, is um, one year and ten days. And again, I don't know about you, but as I mentioned last week when I was a kid, I thought the flood lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. They get on the ark, it rains 40 days, they get off. Uh, but obviously it is a bit longer than that. This is a year-long process. And it is a violent process, isn't it? Messy. Uh, we think of those who survived floods today and the homes, for example, that were inundated by Hurricane Katrina. Um, I've read about you know, flood recovery and apparently just psychologically it is harder to recover from a flooded home than it is from a house that's burned in a fire. Uh, oftentimes with a fire, everything is gone. But with a flood, a lot of times it's all still there but ruined. And so it's just sorting through it. And uh, just a, a terrible thing to endure emotionally. But what a what an amazing thing this was that God was so upset with everything on the earth that he would decide to destroy it in that way. So a year-long process. Well, let's conclude tonight with Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. Genesis 8, verses 20 through 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Notice here, when it's all over, one of the first things he does, Noah offers a sacrifice. 
We referred to this a week or two ago when we noted that Noah took seven extra pairs of the clean animals, most likely for this reason. Again, it certainly would have been a shame to honor God for ending the flood by offering sacrifices that would have caused the extinction of certain animals. And we talked about that a couple weeks when he put these animals on the ark. And so apparently they bring extra clean animals on board for this reason, for the purpose of sacrifice, which points to this idea of hope. This was not a permanent thing. God was saving them. There would be reason to praise God and to sacrifice when the flood is over. And here we see that that is the case. In verse 21, we have a reference to the Lord uh, smelling this soothing aroma. And that is a rather interesting phrase, isn't it? A soothing aroma. It's found 42 times in the New American Standard Bible. Uh, apparently, God, for some reason, enjoys the smell of those sacrifices, and this continues throughout the Old Testament. And I sometimes think of these passages when I'm grilling meat in the backyard. Maybe you've thought of this yourself, or maybe you will in the future. Um, at our house in Wisconsin, we grill year-round, don't we? At, at our house, we do. We keep a snow shovel by the back door. And because you know, grill access must be maintained at all times, at all hours of day or night, we got to be able to get to it. Uh, but I'm just saying there is something perhaps almost inherently enjoyable about the smell of a charcoal fire and grilling meat. I, not all of you may enjoy that smell. I think probably most of us do. Even if it's not us grilling, we enjoy it when the neighbors do it. It's just, uh, it's just a good smell. And sometimes I wonder whether it all goes back to this. We are made in the image of God. And perhaps this is at least some part of it. I don't know. I'm not swearing to that. I'm just saying it's an interesting idea. And I know when I grill out in the backyard, this is a passage that comes to mind. It is a soothing aroma. Uh, nevertheless, upon smelling the sacrifice, the Lord promises to never destroy the earth like this again. There will never be another worldwide flood. We'll get back to that in chapter 9 next week. But he ends this passage in verse 22 with a little section here that is set aside in most translations as poetry. So there's some structure to it, maybe some rhyme or rhythm in the Hebrew language. There, there is something here like a song or a poem. And what we have here is this promise that as long as the earth remains, the human race will always have the ability to plant and to harvest. There will always be seasons somewhere on this planet. There will always be day and there will always be night. And I know we have many people panicking today over some environmental issues and we do have some uh, very good reasons to be concerned and to be somewhat alarmed. I wouldn't maybe alarm not is, is not the best way of thinking about that, but we have reasons to be concerned about what's going on in the world around us with the planet itself. As human beings, we discussed uh, several weeks ago that we are stewards of the earth. God put Adam and Eve on this earth to manage the creation, to name the animals, to attend the garden. And we, as the human race, we have not always done a good job, have we? We have some issues. We have not always honored this stewardship that God has entrusted us with. Uh, back in the 1980s, I remember we had a display in the entryway of our school down in Crystal Lake, Illinois, a warning of the coming ice age. As I remember, it was like a, like a Time magazine type cover that had been uh, laminated or mounted on a plaque, just telling us to be good to the earth because the uh, ice age is right around the corner and any moment now we're going to just plunge into the you know, negatives below zero, there will be no more crops, and we're all going to freeze and then starve to death. And and a great thing to put out there for kindergartners in the uh, in the 1980s. Uh, I remember uh, Leonard Nimoy, uh, Spock from Star Trek, uh, had a terrifying, absolutely terrifying video back then, warning that we were all about to freeze to death at any moment. Just a few minutes long, and I think you can find it if you go on YouTube and search for Leonard Nimoy. Um, uh, climate disaster, ice age, that kind of thing. I'm sure you'll find it. I watched it again a few uh, a few years ago. But man, if if Spock says the planet's going to freeze and we're all going to die, that he had some credibility back there in the mid '80s. 
And um, I don't hear too much about the coming Ice Age anymore. But there's always some reason to be concerned about the world around us. And we do need to take care of the world. We need to do our part in my understanding of Scripture to conserve, uh, to protect our resources, to manage the earth to the best of our ability. Um, but at the same time, shouldn't we also take comfort in verse 22? While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. As long as the earth remains, uh, there will always be seasons. We will always be able to plant and harvest somewhere on this planet. And I take great comfort in that. This is not something that I am going to lose sleep over. Uh, not something that I will worry about, but I think we do need to continue to protect our resources, be good to the environment, and so on. Uh, but certainly this is nothing that we need to be uh, panicking over. This is a, a promise from God that I think gives us uh, great comfort even today. Well, this brings us to the end of our study tonight. I hope you can be with us next week as we study Genesis 9 and what happens right after the flood. An interesting passage. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we're thankful for your promise that we will always have seasons as long as the earth stands. But with that promise, we also have the reminder that the earth itself will not stand forever. Thank you, Father, for teaching us how to prepare spiritually for that day to come. Tonight we pray for Carson and his family. We pray that you will give him strength and peace and bless his parents as well. Thank you for making him a part of that family. Be with all of our friends and our loved ones who are facing health concerns. There are so many things going on in our congregation right now. Bless us with wisdom so that we would all know how to help just as we should, just as your son has, has modeled for us. Father, thank you for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. We come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.